All right. Hello, everybody. I am here today with Brandon Duke. Uh, I'm really excited to talk with Brandon and learn more about his story. Um, but before we kind of get into that, um, Brandon is on the board of the UCA, which is the Unitarian Christian Alliance. And uh, the, I, I just wanted to give a, a shout out and a plug that the Unitarian Christian Alliance is having a conference October 15th through 17th this year in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I will put a, a link to the website for that down in the description, but Brandon, do you want to tell us about that conference? Yeah, thanks. I'm extremely excited about it um, for a lot of reasons. One of them is the speaker lineup. If anybody goes to the actual website, uh, follow the link, um, check out the actual schedule and uh, for anybody that's that's familiar with Unitarianism or that's sort of in the movement, I think they'll be very excited at the speaker lineup. There's people that have been Sam's guests in the past and uh, and others, and I've gotten a sneak peek at some of the topics too, and I, I think people are going to find it really useful. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be three days of uh, pretty nerdy theological talk <laughs> in the best <laughs> sense of the word um with people that are they've been preparing for for months and um uh, the idea is to have it be um sort of an academic type conference rather than uh say converge which was really a great family time and an opportunity for uh for lots of people to come together this is really more oriented towards um people that are that are really interested in sitting through uh a dozen hours of pretty <laughs> intense lectures mm -hmm. and then fellowshipping afterwards and, and, uh, and getting the opportunity to, to network with other Unitarians. I mean, we really see, uh, you know, because this thing was delayed last year due to COVID, it's really our first opportunity for UCA members to, to really get together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. And the venue we have is, is, is nice. It'll fit, uh, sounds like up to maybe 200 people and, and, uh, there's going to be food so that uh, it's once you get there, you can just focus on on what's happening. And uh, we're uh, like I said, we're, we're inviting all Unitarians to, to, to come out and join us. Um, there will be um, edited versions of the, the presentations that will get posted to YouTube. But uh, but don't don't miss out at the, the opportunity to actually, mm -hmm. you know, rub elbows with people that you agree with. Um, it's pretty valuable. So so come join the first one. It's it's going to be fun. Yeah, I, I I'm excited. Um, it's it's just a different experience to actually meet people in person in real life. than I feel like for so many of us, too much of our lives have been online for the last year and a half, <laughs> two years. Um, and and that it, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, get to I, I've met actually I've met a decent number of you guys in person because I was at Converge. I met mm -hmm. I met you. I met mm -hmm. um, Dale Tuggy, Keegan Chandler, Bill Schlegel, um, and I think Jerry Werewell too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the the speaker list. I don't know Dr. Stephen uh, Snowblin. Um, mm. I'm not sure if I've interacted with him before. I have not met him yet either, but I've been doing a little bit of research before the the conference. I got to look at some of his work, and he's quite the expert on Isaac Newton and newton's uh religious views and um and what he's got lined up for us um for the conference is interesting too it's it's a historical figure that i'm that i had not been familiar with i had to google him <laughs> um and it sounds like a really interesting figure and a, an inspirational and insightful story for unitarians so um so yeah i'm excited to hear snowblin and and uh, you know it'll be bill schlegel and patrick navas and um and a bunch of the folks that you already mentioned so yeah, mm -hmm. should be good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll be it will be in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, yep. There's uh, hotels and stuff nearby to the conference should be pretty. It, 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 Nashville is a good central location uh, in terms of the United States. And it's also sort of a hub of, of Unitarianism there. I think uh, Dale Tuggy and Bill Schlegel and uh, others uh, go to a, a church um, in Nashville that seems to be one of yep. the the most I don't know maybe thriving or successful biblical Unitarian churches in the country. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to be able to fellowship with Dale Tuggy and Bill Schlegel on a regular basis. So, yeah, Unitarians have been sort of flocking there. Um, I know several that have moved for exactly that purpose, and 
Uh, I envy them a tad. <laughs> my uh, my work life doesn't allow for that kind of flexibility, but uh, but I understand why why people are drawn. It's yeah, it's a good spot. It's maybe it's in the suburbs. It's maybe um, 15 minutes north of Nashville, and there are within 10 minutes of the of the conference site. There's over a dozen hotels. So whatever your your uh, flavor is, it's there, mm-hmm. and there's uh, there's food. And um, if uh, if people need help with transportation or anything like that. Um, you know, they can, they can mark that when they register and we can help get people connected with, uh, with local folks and can help them get where they need to go. And, uh, yeah, indeed that, uh, there's the big, the big church there in white house and folks there have graciously, uh, been willing to help get us prepared for it. So yeah. Bruh. Uh, well, great. I, I hope that, that people that are interested will, will follow up on that and, uh, and I'll put, the links to the conference and registration and all that. So look in the description if you're interested. Um, I want to talk about the Unitarian Christian Alliance, but before we do that, I want to back up and, and learn a little bit more about Brandon. Um, I Like I said, I, I've met you before. I was at the Converge conference two years ago, and I can remember having, there was that one conversation I remember after like the last presentation at night where a whole bunch of people just like stood on the sidewalk uh, for like <laughs> two hours. hours or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The gospel of John has a way of doing that to people. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can't help, but, uh, but stand around and, and talk about it. No, I'll never forget that. I, it was, uh, yeah, it was really fun meeting you in a, in that kind of way. <laughs> yeah. And th- yeah, that was a, that was a really cool event and um, kind of pivotal I think in my life personally, but I think for other people that attended it, that it was a, it was a really meaningful thing. So yeah. hopefully the, the UCA conference can kind of carry that banner that, that, mm-hmm. uh, that Converge got, got going. Yeah. Great. So, um, so tell me a little bit about what your, your faith journey has been like your, your upbringing and how did you come to end up to be on the board of uh, the Unitarian <laughs> Christian Alliance? Yeah, it's, uh, as it always is, uh, it's, a, it's a long story for people, so I'll try to make it uh, not so long and not so boring. I I grew up a preacher's kid, um, and uh, in some ways, I I listened to your your uh, your interview with Sean Finnegan, and in a lot of ways, I I see parallels in our stories. We both came out of uh, groups that, from the outside, were usually considered cults. <laughs> we're both preachers' kids. Um, we both end up having to answer for our that tradition, even though by the time we were teenagers, we weren't even in it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I was a part of a group called, I grew up in, let me phrase it that way. I grew up in a a group called the worldwide church of God led by a guy Mm -hmm. named Herbert Armstrong. Yeah. And, uh, he was just a radio preacher from the, uh, church of God, seventh day, seventh day Adventist kind of, uh, wing of, of Protestantism. And he had built this, he had built this fairly thriving ministry with something like a hundred thousand members across the planet. And they had a uh, they had a Christian college. They actually had two. They had one in Pasadena, California. That's where I was born. Uh, while my parents were in college there, and then I grew up on their other college campus in East Texas, in Big Sandy, Texas. And uh, so my my childhood was full of uh, of fun. They had horses and uh, and a, a great ag program and all that stuff. So. Uh, there was always fun stuff to do. I had great babysitters. <laughs> there was always college kids that would take us to do fun stuff. But about the time I was 12 or so, uh, Armstrong passed away and there was a power struggle uh, within the church. And uh, It's almost eerily <laughs> similar. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. And, um, and so my father actually ended up resigning in protest as the, the church. It was not Unitarian. It was Binitarian, although... A little bit of yeah, nuance is required there. Yeah, go go into what was the Christology uh, and theology of uh, of Armstrongism or Worldwide Church of God? What what, what did he teach? Because it, it's <laughs> kind of unique. I was I, I know a couple other people that that grew up in that tradition. It, it's a it's a unique thing that that is is a little bit hard to categorize. Yeah, I agree. And I would add that it depends on where you were within that organization. It wasn't monolithic, although they thought it was, as most somewhat authoritarian organizations do. Everyone thinks they're on the same page. And then when everybody starts talking, they realize they're not. and <laughs> You get mm-hmm. church splits. Um, so I've gone back and done a little bit of reading on this and uh, listened to some old sermons of Armstrong's. 
uh, kind of in retrospect, after learning much more about the Trinity, I, it was not on my radar as a teenager. It was, it was, uh, things like the law and, you know, they were a, a Torah observant, uh, group. And so that was really the distinctive for them. It was Sabbath keeping and food laws and Holy day observance and all that stuff. But they all, he also taught this kind of, um, it's almost a hybrid view of sort of if, if you can have a Trinity, but just remove the Holy Spirit from it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and instead of referring to it as the Godhead, he'd refer to it as the God family. Mm -hmm. And there was this real emphasis on what I would call theosis today, which I don't know that they ever use the term, right. but the idea that in a resurrection that people are going to join that, that family. And so it was more by analogy than by explicit teaching. I've, I've heard uh, Worldwide Church of God, you know, splinter group uh preachers uh affirm the co-equality and the co-eternality of jesus um as the word and um i've heard others that were very subordinationist i mean my, my own dad i've gone back through his notes and some of his old sermons that i've got and um uh, he would i would define him as an arian uh mm -hmm. not a binitarian yeah so um so i guess i get my unitarianism honestly even if i didn't know that's what it was yeah <laughs> growing up um but yeah, I would argue that that Armstrong's theology on this was really confused. Uh, there's a clip that maybe I'll send you from when he's 70 or so years old, and he, he gives an entire hour long sermon on basically this whole subject. And he contradicts himself repeatedly. It's just a confused mess. And it just wasn't a focus for people. Um, I also read in the 70s, they put together a, uh, a committee to put together a systematic theology for the group. <laughs> and it got to uh draft stage before the kibosh got put on it and mm -hmm. it got put in a drawer uh because it raised too many problem <laughs> troublesome <laughs> questions uh so uh, if you're gonna have an authoritarian uh, church don't create a systematic <laughs> theology committee apparently <laughs> um, or at least have a systematic theology before you do <laughs> that's right that's right whoever's going to be in charge you better have it in your pocket um uh, <laughs> And not be figuring out as you go yeah. so um so anyway that's that's some so some start to there so as a teenager i watched that split apart and it split because as armstrong died uh his successor and some others that that were in that key circle started re-examining the doctrine of the trinity uh, a couple of key uh, key members of the church were going to fuller seminary um and basically just got turned around and so rather than you know walking away from the church they decided they were going to save the church uh for evangel uh, evangelism and uh and within a few years by 1997 the church was fully trinitarian uh they'd abandoned Sab sabbath keeping uh they were they were basically you could walk across the street to the first baptist church and be in the same <laughs> be in the mm -hmm. same same yeah, place they, they had melded back into something recognizably yeah. mainstream evangelical yep. or thereabouts yep yeah um, and from and for for some good reasons right i mean there were some the the um the clergy laity structure that it had developed was really unhealthy and um so there were some good reasons that the that the church needed ref <laughs> needed reform um but for people like my dad who had had consciously rejected the trinity and 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 other doctrines it was you know it's a bridge way too far so uh so when i was i guess 12 years old my dad resigned i had I, from his position at the college um, um the did, when came. when armstrong was alive was it like a self-conscious part of the church's identity that they were not trinitarian yeah as a yeah yeah and if you look at their materials it's really interesting they'll they'll do you know an article in one of their publications about how terrible the trinity is and they follow the same kind of arguments that biblically unitarians do today uh look it's not in the new testament it's not in the old testament uh boom 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 and then they get to that those those logos theologians in the second century and uh and then they kind of agree with them <laughs> yeah i um, mean it, it's not that dissimilar from like justin martyr really yes that is the closest thing i'd compare it to is is justin martyr um mm -hmm. where the, he, you know he's got a second god i mean that's the way they talked about about jesus that he's a second god in the god family yeah um, and and that and the that the goal is that like jesus brings his divinity down to us and that we can get lifted back up into the divinity yes. that jesus has so that we can be like uh adopted children jesus is yes. the the true god son 
and then we yes. become sort of adopted God's sons through Jesus, but God the Father is sort of above and atop the family or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and that's where it gets interesting because some of the theology is very subordinationist, but then they'd also make these these co-equality claims from time to time between the two. So I just think it was contradictory. <laughs> I think yeah. it was it was just an error. But yeah, if you compare it to Justin Martyr, I think that's the closest analogy. And I remember my dad talking about when he was at their uh, at their college, you know, being trained for the for the ministry. He described it that history, there was this veil of of silence from the time of the, the you know end of the apostles to you know two or three hundred AD. And mm -hmm. that's what they'd been taught. And so there was just this blind spot, you know, I mean, to be fair, this is before the internet. It's not all of the, most of these guys weren't professionally or they weren't academics. Mm -hmm. So they just didn't, um, they didn't have visibility into some of the church fathers that I think is more easily available now. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just think they made some basic mistakes kind of rolling back the clock, but not far enough. That'd be mm -hmm. my, my assessment. So, um, so yeah, we, we left that and went to one of the splinter groups. My dad was a pastor, one of the splinter groups for my, my late teens. I had had a belly full. I was, a, I was pretty well an agnostic by that point, <laughs> been turned off by church and was trying to hold on to my, my theism. And, uh, and I stopped attending, oh, I don't know, by the time I was 15 or 16. And I spent the last, I'm um, pushing 40 now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've spent the last couple of decades trying to rebuild my Christian faith and re-examine everything. And, uh, the Trinity was kind of late in, the, in that game. It was only, I don't know, four or five years ago where I was listening through a William Lane Craig Sunday school course called Defenders, which is actually pretty good uh, as a way of doing sort of a survey of Christian theology. And he, he laid out what I had never heard before as an adult, which is the Chalcedonian model for, for Christology. And he described these buoys in the, you know, in the, in the river, and you got to stay between, you know, between these two, two buoys of full humanity and full divinity. And I remember pausing my, my podcast app and saying, I don't think this at all. This seems totally wrong. Surely this isn't what other Christians think this weird two natures thing. I just had never been exposed to it. It wasn't, How it wasn't did, a part of my Because tradition. if, if Armstrongism um, believes in like Jesus's pre-existence, then they, they have to believe in an incarnation of some variety. Uh, did they, did they just mm -hmm. not explain that very much? Did they, did they go to one side of the buoy or the other? So this is where, because it wasn't a focus, pastors were all over the place yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were there were lots of kenosis guys that's my dad i describe my dad as a kenosis guy where the logos was eternal but but uh subordinate to the father and then there's this sort of canonic incarnation right where he gives where it all he leaves up. divinity behind and then takes on humanity yeah yep. and yep. so it's a so jesus would be really it would emphasize his humanity yes. while he was uh, on earth Yep. Um, and, and like, like his powers got, you know, stopped at the door between heaven and earth or something like that. Yeah. And I, like I said, uh, by listening to William Lane Craig, it, you can tell where my interest lay. It was, it was in Christian apologetics and, and analytic theology. Um, and so I was, you know, reading about, um, perfect being theology and, and those kinds of things leading up to that. I was really interested in, in divine foreknowledge and became an open theist. And, um, and some of these other questions, I kind of stumbled into this, into incarnation because it just hadn't been, like I said, hadn't been on my radar. And, uh, and I guess, you know, we all kind of come home to where we start sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and it just, the, the dual natures uh, Christology just didn't work for me. And, uh, incarnation Christology doesn't work for me now either because I, I have no idea how you maintain identity through that process. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's other than the biblical argument. That's my biggest complaint is I don't understand how you can become a fetus and still retain everything that you had before. Yeah. Um, and so that led me looking for other materials on the Trinity. And I actually, uh, I had no idea the biblical Unitarian world existed. Uh, I didn't even know what a Unitarian really was. Uh, other than even though you kind of kind of there was one, one. <laughs> yeah yeah um so i uh so i started searching for materials and i found dale tuggy's trinity's podcast mm -hmm. and uh six months later i'd listened to i think there were 200 and something episodes of that i binge listened to all of them which led me to uh sean finnegan 
and Keegan Chandler's book and Anthony Buzzard's work and you name it, right? All the, these Unitarian figures. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, I was bought in and, um, and so I knew no one and, uh, and, but I wanted to, I wanted to get connected to some people because we're just out here in a home fellowship, right? Kind of isolated. And uh, so I signed up for Restoration Fellowships Theology Conference in Georgia uh, back in like 2016 or 17. And apparently they just let anybody come because they, they let me just show up uh, for Sana Non Grata. And, uh, <laughs> and I walked up to Dale Tuggy and stuck out my hand. I said, Dr. Tuggy, hi, I'm Brandon Duke. You don't know me from Adam, but thank you very much for your work. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and he was very gracious and uh, not too freaked out. And uh, I'm and sure now, he has that happen from time to time. <laughs> I, I, I did that to him too one time. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and that actually that weekend was the first that I heard about the the idea of the UCA forming, mm -hmm. because it became obvious that for guys like me and many many others and gals. Um, we came to this theological position and then we're like, well, what do we do now? Um, mm -hmm. You know, where do we go? What are our options? You know, I was researching uh, Unitarian denominations and different churches and trying to kind of get the lay of the land. And um, you just walk around in a fog. You don't, you don't know what's out there. You don't even know what your, your options are. And then you also kind of feel this, this urge to, to spread it. You know, it's like, if this is true, boy, that the world really needs this. And so um, I'll never forget standing in the parking lot, listening to Dale Tuggy and Keegan Chandler, you know, talk about this idea, listening to them and Sean Finnegan and others talking about it around a table. And I was just bought in. I, I said, I want to be a part of this in any way that I can. And, uh, and uh, years later, I got to, got to help participate in, in sort of moderating some of these Facebook groups because I'm fairly active on Facebook. And, uh, and yeah, a few months ago, I got invited to participate on the board of the board of the UCA and, uh, one of my roles is is to try and keep the the social uh, the sh social media stream filled, which I fail at on a regular basis. But we've mm -hmm. we've got some video content out there, and um, well, and it we'll takes something like a saint to moderate a Facebook group. So <laughs> someone far better than me, I know that. Like, uh, no, it's it's entirely true. And when you have a a purpose like the UCA does of uniting unitarians that share unit that unitarian theology but really not much else mm -hmm. uh they're diverse across a lot of other views yeah, yeah it becomes a, becomes a real challenge to say yeah let's let's make sure and share what we we think with each other so we can find like-minded unitarians um and let's do it in a spirit of charity and and goodwill um when when people tend to get heated and you know unitarianism doesn't necessarily normally draw the meek and the quiet <laughs> it's it's people that <laughs> yeah, be, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, it's the people that tend to be pretty invested in whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so it can be full of firebrands and whatnot. But, um, you know, it's just a Facebook group. The actual UCA, you know, website is where the real the real value is because people can register there and they can they can actually put themselves on the map, not too specific to their zip code. Yeah. Um, so so what is the Unitarian Christian Alliance and and, and what's its purpose? Okay, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, so it's, it's missions twofold. The first is to connect like minded Unitarians, because very often, we're scattered, we're on our own, kind of like my story. Yeah. And, uh, and so to that mission, there's a there's an online directory, people can go for free to the website, they can register, I, I did this, and it puts a dot on your zip code that there's a Unitarian there, or a Unitarian church, you can register your church or your home fellowship or whatever you've, you've got going. Um, and then people can go on and look and they can find you or you can find them. And you can use the, the messaging tool within it to, to reach out to somebody and say, hey, you know, what do you guys think? What, what are you doing? And try and, find, try and find some fellowship. And then the second mission is just to promote Unitarian theology to the rest of the Christian world. Um, and to that, actually there's, there's quite a bit of things that we're trying to do. There's a there's a publishing wing of the of the UCA that's that's working on uh, that's working on publishing Unitarian works. There's the little social media committee uh, where we're trying to we're trying to use social media to, to get the word out. And uh, and there's some other there's some other things that we have going, including uh, this what I think is really important this conference where Unitarians can can get together. Like there's there are a lot of uh, really good Unitarian content creators out there. Lots of great blogs. I love this for what it's worth. 
now I'm going to plug you. <laughs> I love the channel. Um, I love the people that you've had on. I, I really enjoy it. Um, and I think it's, it's really valuable. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of that out there. And so one of the things that I'd like to see happen from the conference is, is content creators and others um, can come together and network to make ourselves even more effective and encourage others that they would like to have a voice to get, to get out there and to enable that. So, um, I mean, in some sense, we'd like to take over the Christian world <laughs> with, with Unitarianism. Don't, don't tell uh, them that. Don't tell them that. <laughs> well, I got to tell you right now, if I could get William Lane Craig to come out and denounce us, that would be great. Uh, I would take it. Uh, and, and, and some more there's, there's, there's just a, a shocking lack of awareness. I mean, even a guy like me that grew up basically in a somewhat Unitarian world, I didn't have the word for it. I didn't have the, right? the mental map. I, I honestly didn't know the word biblical Unitarian until a couple of years ago. And yeah. then when I heard it, I like probably searched on Wikipedia. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's right. That's what I believe. But yep. I, I, I just, growing up, I was, I, we didn't believe, we weren't Trinitarians. Right. <laughs> we didn't think Jesus was God. Yeah. And that was, we did, but we didn't have a theological label or I, I yeah. was unaware really that anyone unrelated to the group that I had kind of come from had a similar idea. So. Yep. Likewise. And there was something, um, I mean, some of that, I think it was just honest. I mean, I, I'm reminded my mother, I think, won't mind me saying this, but I'm like, mom, how did you guys not know about this wider world of, of there's all this scholarship about, you know, the first and second century. And, and there's all this stuff about, you know, the, the fourth century councils. Like how did, how is this not you know, just an obvious part of the, of the teaching? She's like, Brandon, you gotta remember, this is before the internet. What mm -hmm. we had for information were like magazines and correspondence courses. And there was just limited information for a lot of people. And particularly for, you know, my folks were, uh, former Southern Baptists that, you know, uh, not a long list of, of highly educated folks in, in my line, a lot of uh, Southeast Missouri cotton pickers. And so, um, yeah, I think maybe we're just coming to a point in history where the, the access to information is changing things. And, you know, a guy like me that, that uh, we can, you and I can go to Wikipedia and say, oh yeah, that's it. And then we can go to YouTube and we can find dozens of videos from people talking about it from all different sides. And we can, we can, you know, make up our minds. That's a, that's a special and unique thing that just has not existed in history until now. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm excited to see what happens from it. And the UCA is trying to, to position itself um, to, to help with that. And yeah. it's not a church. It's not a denomination. Right. A this is important. To help it. Yeah. Yeah. This, <laughs> I, is, this isn't a church. There's lots of people that are going to be in the UCA alongside you if you join um, that you're going to have serious theological disagreements with that you mm -hmm. might not even uh, join in communion with. Um, but look, we do this all the time with other with other topics, right? With, you know, for people that are uh, that are concerned about e the, the doctrine of eternal conscious torment. Um, there are plenty of groups pushing back on that. And if you're a pro-lifer, you join arms with all kinds of people uh, in, in that, in that. And, you know, if the, the NRA folks in the NRA don't all agree on, on everything else, right? Right. <laughs> um, not that the UCA is a Unitarian NRA, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a poor, poor analogy, but, but we do this all the time and we can mm -hmm. walk and chew bubble gum. We can, we can kind of have our circles of association where we have our, we have our, our fellowships where we're, we're together regularly. And we have these wider circles where, we, where we share common interests and we work together. So, um, the, so the is UCA is a, a wider circle than a church or even a denomination. Yeah. yeah absolutely. It's something, it's, it's something bigger than that. It's like a, a shared, um, I don't know, uh, theological advocacy group or, yeah. or something like that. I love, I love that term. It's almost mm -hmm. like a special interest group, right? In politics where, you know, you've got your, you've got your policy that you'd like to see implemented. And, um, and so you, you, like I said, you advocate for it. it's almost, it's almost like a think tank too. I, I like to think of it that way because um, hopefully the UCA is going to bring together the, you know, some of the best Unitarian thinkers and give them the, the platform and the tools and the resources to, to have a much, a much wider impact than otherwise they would have. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that was my big excitement. I mean, I, I very much like the idea of, of guys like me being able to find like-minded, minded people, but I'd rather see, you know, the Southern Baptist convention someday 
in an uproar because there's a uh, a Unitarian subset. Well, well, they are definitely already in an uproar. Right. We, that that part. Of it, right, but for this, you know, us. I don't want I don't want to see the Methodists break up over gay marriage or female pastorship or something like that. I want them I, I want them struggling with this question. I want all of Christianity to to to, to have the opportunity to evaluate this for themselves the way that we have to know that it's on the table. And it reminds me a little bit of the, the, you know, divine foreknowledge and sovereignty arguments, you know, between Calvinists, Arminians and Molinists and open theists, open theism is genuinely on the table. Now it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the, the live options that people get to look at and wherever you come down, I, I think that's really important to, to have all the live options on the table and be able to evaluate it for yourself um, I think we have that responsibility as seekers, you know, as, as seekers of God to, to mm -hmm. make sure that we're not, uh, we're not stuck in a hole and, and we don't know it. I, I was yeah. talking to, to, to a sort of force ourselves into the Overton window yeah. of, of Christological conversation in the broader, I don't know, Protestant Christian community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's my dream for the UCA along with connecting lots and lots of people is, is to see that see that change and and so to that um look we don't want to stick our finger in in trinitarian's eye we want to persuade people but if there are trinitarian apologists out there that want to describe how how terrible unitarianism is i'd like for them to use their entire platform <laughs> <laughs> to say to say that um and so that's why you know you see unitarians taking debates and um and and going out to these audiences because you know you don't need to win everybody you just need to you need to make people aware so they can decide for themselves and yeah. and in a lot of christianity it's just not it's not on the table yet so and i can make some progress on that i think we would both agree that the the numbers of people that are sitting in the pews of plain old trinitarian churches throughout the country and throughout the world who either have confusion or perhaps some private conviction that they don't quite know the words for mm -hmm. that aren't Trinitarian is way, way bigger oh, yeah. than, than people are aware of. And it's yeah. just that they're often isolated in their own heads and they might be, they might know that this is one of those subjects that they shouldn't speak their mind on. Absolutely. We get messages from people like that all the time. I got a message on YouTube today on one of our videos with a guy saying, I'm so glad to know I'm not the only one that has concerns about this. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't saying that he was a Unitarian, but he's like, I just have concerns about the Trinity. And mm -hmm. so he responded to one of those, one of the, the three blunders in church history video uh, that led to the Trinity. And he said, this is so helpful. Thank you. And look, this guy's not a Unitarian yet necessarily, or this gal, um, but at least now the, the conversation's open for him. And if he decides that based on his best exegesis and historical research, that the tradition's right, then that's him doing his due diligence and he's got to follow his conscience. But at least we've done our job in, in, in presenting the case and hopefully we'll do a better job of presenting in the future. I mean, to your point about the, the supposed monopoly on, of Trinitarianism on Christians, look, we, we know from surveys, you know, the last... Uh, Legionnaire Ministries survey showed 50% of respondents didn't consider the Holy Spirit a person. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> they're either confused or there's half of the Christians out there that, that were surveyed aren't Trinitarians. Right. Um, and, 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 some, and some absurd percentage thought that Jesus was the first creature created by God. Yeah. And then some uh, other super shockingly high percentage uh, thought that Jesus was not God. Yes. And like you could even filter to like within Catholicism or within evangelicalism. And it's like, all right, within evangelicalism and shows up to church at least once a month. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I'm, I'll be shooting from the hip. Maybe I'll, I'll put a link to that too, because it was fascinating, yeah. but it was something like 20% or yeah. something. It was between 20 and 30% of people that basically held a Socinian Christology. <laughs> In evangelical churches yes. that are almost certainly Trinitarian on their statement of faith. And yep. so, so that's like a couple million people, right? Yeah. In the United States alone. Yeah, it's, it's a huge number of people that said, yes, I'm a Trinitarian. No, Jesus is not God. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so look, I, I just, I do. I think that there's massive confusion. And look, Trinitarian apologists know this. I, I heard a quote from James White a while back who said he thought maybe 5% of people in the pews had a non-heretical Trinity 
<laughs> doctrine in their heads. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. Um, yeah. Partially because I, I don't know how you have a, I mean, other than just doing what he does, which is say some words, but don't define all your terms. Right. Um, as soon as you start explicating it, I'm just convinced uh, you either end up in tritheism or modalism collapsing the father and the son, one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, Although or, we've got or some... you just say what you're not enough times, <laughs> right. right? Like you say, I'm not on that side of this buoy right. and I'm not on this side of this buoy. Right. But then the question, okay, so where exactly are you in between? <laughs> well, let me, let me refer you back <laughs> yeah. to my statement of faith and yeah. my creed and good luck. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree. And uh, <laughs> that also reminds me, um, I lost, lost my train of thought. I was going to say something else about, about people's confusion about the train. Oh, the the number of options that are on the table are growing and thanks in part to Dale Tuggy's work. So if you check out his article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, mm -hmm. it used to have basically three main categories, one self-Trinitarians, three self-Trinitarians and Mysterians. Well, he's gone and updated it with some more categories <laughs> yeah. for, for self-Trinitarians where who define- Which I actually think is way more common than people realize. I, yeah. I think, well, I think it's Chad McIntosh, White. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, who I think has been on the channel. Um, yeah. I, believe, I believe I heard him interviewed. I mean, um, I think James White at the end of the day is a four self-Trinitarian. The being, of, like he makes this that, that super strong being person distinction- Right. Yeah. I was listening to Jake Brancatella, the Muslim mm -hmm. uh, metaphysician, our debate James White recently on the Trinity. I'm hoping to talk to Jake uh, specifically on my channel about that, that awesome. debate. But like when you listen to James White, he's like super emphasizing the being person distinction. And so you can talk about the being of God as himself, and you can talk about the three persons as himself. So it's mm -hmm. like, so the Trinity is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and God. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And, and and it's really it's a quaternity but there's yeah. like two shelves right yeah. on the top shelf is the god being and then on the bottom shelf is the three persons but they're yeah. all selves and yeah they, and we shouldn't forget william lane craig's view where you have these like functions <laughs> that are the three persons and 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 there's just it's it's on and on and, and mm -hmm. my favorite right now and I can't remember his name at the moment. He was just on the Trinity's podcast uh, a few months back. And I've, I apologize to him, but who argues for uh, true contradictions yeah. that in some cases you can have logical contradictions that are true and all the rest of us go, ow. Right. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, but within the Trinity uh, world, this is accepted. And, you know, it, it's kind of astonishing. I, I, I'm surprised there's not um, more serious struggle and pushback between each of these camps on each other. And I, the only thing, the only way I can explain that is they're united against the common enemy of, of non-Trinitarianism. Right. And um, for the record, that's Dr. J.C. Beale. Thank you, Dr. Um, was Beale. Was the, yep. the guest who argued for that the incarnation basically is a true contradiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and argued... If, if you haven't heard that podcast folks go check it out sorry for plugging the trinity's podcast that, that's trinity's episode 324 and 325 i'll, I'll link in, that too in the first in the first of those two he lays out what sounds like a biblical unitarian critique of two natures christology and he basically says there these absolutely are contradictions folks you know i'll, I'll do respect to to trinitarians that try to ex, you know explain it away um this is just a contradiction and we should accept it um which is exactly the same line of thinking that a guy like me goes down except to say i have no good epistemological justification to accept true contradictions and uh and the second episode is him making his case for for why i should reevaluate that <laughs> someone like me should reevaluate that mm -hmm. i'm just not persuaded we, we don't do this anywhere yeah. else it's totally special pleading and mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's interesting to see what the trinitarian world is doing in response to the work of people like Dale. I, I think it is interesting once pressure is sort of put on Trinitarianism, it begins to splinter, right? It, it yes. becomes it becomes like a hundred different things. It's like some yes. weird hydra. And it's like, <laughs> so where where are you, Trinity? You know, yeah. like it, it's it, it's yeah. really kind of you know bizarre. Yeah. I mean it's it's to me, it seems like exactly what you would expect if the Trinity is post-biblical philosophical speculation 
and it's mm -hmm. it's not divinely inspired that's exactly what you would expect we see the same thing happen um in other religious traditions whenever we see something where we like oh that's an error uh, then it does it creates all of these spin-offs and splinters and 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 alternative ways to explain it so you know i um i don't want to lean too hard on you know the mm -hmm. philosophy of science but you know we know how to evaluate theories and simplicity and uniformity is one when we have too many theories to explain something we know we haven't gotten down to the to the root science yet right um some we've made a mistake somewhere we're lacking some piece of information i just think the christian church is just lacking the piece of information that god is one person and that jesus is a human messiah they don't have the right concept of of what a, a christ was and or was to be and so they're stuck and i think in good faith many 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 christians try to do their best to toe the line and understand the tradition um, but they're not all church historians and they're not mm -hmm. all, um, you know, seminary trained theologians. And those that are, that's where the, you start seeing the fight because they know there's a fight to be had. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like I said, circling back to the purpose of the UCA, this conversation we're having, whether we're right or not, I think needs to happen in, within Christianity, the same way the discussion about God's, you know, foreknowledge, you know, pushing back on on calvinism needs to happen within the protestant tradition the same way push back on eternal conscious torment needs to happen in my view <clears throat> and other and other elements of the tradition i i very much relate to uh to the the restorationist identity um of either the stone campbell movement or i i like pointing people to uh, sean finnegan's restorationist manifesto i didn't have a term for what i was until i <laughs> listened to that i'm like oh yeah that's that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, restorationism. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, and, and I could look back at generations of my family and I'm like, that's what they were all doing. They're, as Protestants, they were trying to continue the Reformation. They were trying to gather the information they had. And that's how they ended up in a cult is because they, they knew that, um, that where they were wasn't right. That didn't fit with their Bible. And so they kept looking. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, in, in my own family's history, I'm proud of a lot of it. There's some of it where I'm like, guys, I'd like to go back and tell my have 10 minutes with my grandfather to say hey let's let's talk about some of this stuff um but look that's that i like to have that see that conversation happen with with, with those, those of us that are alive today yeah. and um and give people a chance to evaluate the evaluate the options right so so you, you we both know that th there are paths towards spiritual unhealthiness that uh <laughs> that churches or denominations can head in yeah. and that that's a that's a real place uh, of, yes. of uh, authoritarian leadership or yes. other other forms of, of spiritual unhealth. And, yep. and we've either seen that or like, honestly, the church I grew up in was not a cult. It was fine. It was healthy, sure. but that's because it had left a cult and knew <laughs> that it didn't want to be a cult. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and I was to, to, sorry to interrupt, but to, to my, my experience was not cultish because my dad was the pastor. And he mm -hmm. was not like that. He he yeah. he felt like he was a servant leader, and and so my little part of that hundred thousand people group, it I didn't have that experience. But I've talked to yeah. other people that were they were terribly spiritually abused. Right. Yeah. So we yeah. sorry to your point. Yes, absolutely. We that happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the UCA is not a church, nor is it a denomination. Yep. Yeah. Um, where, like we said, something like a theological advocacy group uh, yeah. or common interest uh, cause group. Um, but how, how do we make sure that we don't, I don't know, uh, push things yeah. in a spiritually unhealthy direction? Or what's our role yeah. if we see, you know, what, what because a lot, a, a decent proportion of Unitarian groups are either cults have a cult-like reputation right. or something like that how do we interact with those sorts of groups in a way that's healthy yeah that's that's a great question like jehovah's witness for example absolutely you know, being like the most obvious example yeah so i have to be honest it's something i'm still working through i mean even in my own life but but also in the bigger uca picture um because there are there's a lot of these pitfalls i i think the first thing that we can do is we can continue to really clearly define the mission and to, to make it very narrow. If the mission is to connect people with like-minded Unitarians, then anybody that's a Unitarian is welcome to, you know, put your pen on the map. 
Um, and it's no endorsement of them other than they've agreed to this narrow, narrow affirmation that the UCA has. And so I, I think that's important to make sure that, that, that contrary to what people would really like, people would kind of like some people I've talked to, they kind of like the UCA to become a little denomination or, 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 or a little more specific. Like, yeah. <laughs> or sponsor, sponsor little, uh, little, little startup churches or something in, in its name or something like that. And I think we have to be really careful to avoid that. There are great Unitarian groups that are already doing that. And the UCA wants to empower them to do that. Um, I think the UCA has to be very uh, targeted on our, on the, on those two missions. And, um, and if we do that, then we can avoid playing Kingmaker uh, among any of these groups. We can avoid um, being beholden to any of those groups. Um, and that's why I think individual membership is really healthy. We, we, we want to sponsor and, 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 uh, or promote, forgive me, and bring people to, to these churches that, that agree with them. Um, but the UCA wants to stay agnostic about, um, uh, about where, where people, when they come to the website, where they get directed, we want to have a directory and then let individual Christians that have become Unitarians mm -hmm. decide. Um, Although do we need some sort of filter that's like, are we going to list every Jehovah's Witness congregation <laughs> on our website as a, yeah. as a Unitarian church that people could go check out? So this question of, of who gets, who is so far outside of the affirmation um, that they, that they start violating key, key tenets of it. Um, it's something we're still working through. It's, yeah. we're still young enough and, uh, and small enough that it hasn't become a, a, a key problem yet, but it's something that the board is actively talking about what you're, what you're, you're pointing right. out. Yeah. Is, like is, Iglesia Ni Cristo or something like right. that, like the Filipino group, you know, that's like, yep. yeah, they, they, they have a biblical Unitarian theology to the best that I can tell, but uh, I would not, I would recommend someone go to the Trinitarian Evangelical Church before they go to that church yep. for spiritual unhealth reasons. And this is the second way I would suggest is for people that are in the UCA uh, and particularly in leadership to be very transparent about as for me, as a UCA board member, um, I want as many places as I can to sign up on the directory. I want people to have options, but as Brandon, I totally agree. I would, <laughs> I would tell a new Unitarian, here are the places I'd watch out for. Here's my counsel to you. Mm -hmm. And so you see that you, you see board members have active uh, ministries doing these other things that are in the narrower circle. Right. Yeah. So Sean Finnegan's podcast, it's going to actively uh, advocate for his theological views mm -hmm. and Dale Tuggy's Trinity's podcast um, is not going to, it, he's going to hold his, his views. And, you know, all of these individuals that are within the UCA, they still have responsibilities to each other, like to their fellowships, to their churches, to their denominations and to new Unitarians, to fellow brothers and sisters um, that are coming to this. Um, to be advocates for truth. And so I think if we can just make sure to keep the, the definitions tight, to remember that we can, we can operate in different circles and in different response, we can wear different hats, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that's one way. And we're trying to be as transparent as we can. Look, we're, the, the UCA board, is a, it's a small group. It's, it's five people. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it's something that will live beyond all of us. It'll become a, a self-sustaining organization that can help carry, you know, Unitarianism in a way that maybe the Unitarian Congregationalists or some other, um, some other group in, you know, American history did and, and really make it a, a major player on the, on the world stage. And, you know, that's, that's going to take time. And so I agree, keep uh, focus on, uh, on the mission, I think is, is the best thing, but it's still something that, it's something that I worry about. It's something, look, for example, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a key um, fracture point within the USA right now that we're, that we're trying to, to navigate. The affirmation totally allows Arians and people with other Christologies mm -hmm. to participate. And like even a form of on Armstrongism could have, could probably sign the, yeah. the same. Yeah. So, yeah. 
again, not to out my mother, but she's a perfect example. She says, Brandon, I, st- I know Jesus isn't God, but I still think maybe he preexisted in some way. I, I couldn't quite tell you. I don't think he's Michael. And I'm not, you know, I don't, mm-hmm. but, I, but there's just enough evidence in the, in the scripture for me that I just don't want to rule that out. Um, so in biblical Unitarian circles, they're going to say, come here, sister, let's help you. Yeah. <laughs> let's help. And, and, uh, and that's what happens in my, in my household. <laughs> we, we go round and round. <laughs> um, but, uh, but there's gotta be, there's gotta be a landing place for someone like her, for someone like me originally, for someone, you know, Dale Tuggy talks mm-hmm. about being influenced by, by sort of Aryan, uh, Samuel uh, Clark, and, like Samuel Clark yeah. types. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, on his way from, from Trinitarianism to, to biblical Unitarianism. And so there's, there's got to be a landing place for people like that to find each other um, or to find, you know, if, if you're a biblical Unitarian, why would you not want to be in communication with these people in a way that you honestly can be? Um, mm. You know, maybe you don't have fellowship with them, but wouldn't you like to have dialogue with them? And so yeah. I, I do think there's a value in, in the UCA being a, a way for the movement to interact with each other, the different, the different parts of the, of the Unitarian world. Um, and if you're worried about, you know, people being harmed by authoritarian cults, what better way to have influence over them than, than to have people that are thoughtful, let's say a thoughtful Jehovah's Witness who, or is trapped, or, you know, in the organization because their family or for whatever reason, wouldn't you want them to come on the UCA, you know, directory mm-hmm. And find people they can communicate with. So yeah, I think that's another another point that um, a lot of people don't realize is people might say, "Oh man, biblical Unitarianism or Unitarianism is a gateway to all of these weird cults," but <laughs> we're also a bridge and a gateway out. Yes. And that a lot of biblical Unitarians that are kind of in the I don't know the online network are people who moved from an unhealthy spiritual place to a much healthier one. Yep. And they didn't know that they, there were places that were non-Trinitarian that weren't perhaps the unhealthy group that they were in. Absolutely. They're principled, and, they're principled people that were, that were there partially because of their commitment to this theological view, but they didn't know there were healthier places to go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, we want, we want that bridge, as you put it to, to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have to trust, like there's a, there's a, um, there's a kind of fundamental fear that I think drives, um, isolationism within some Unitarian groups that we're going to be, I, I don't know, tainted by these other ideas or something. And, uh, I love Sean Finnegan's sign off that the truth has nothing to fear. I mean, uh, shouldn't we be willing to, to, you know, offer our, our case in gentleness, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and, and trust that the, the truth's going to win. Um, and, and let that, let that be God's job as far as the, the overarching strategy. I mean, it, there, I came from a group that literally built a fence around its college, <laughs> uh, as a symbol of their isolation and separateness from the world. They didn't just want to be separate from the world as in uh, in the way that they lived and in the in their way that they were following Christ. They wanted to be separate from the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if they could build a moat, they would have. Um, and it, it hurt their Christian outreach, obviously, because um, people see that and they say, what do you have to fear? What are you afraid of where you're hiding behind your walls? So to Unitarians that are that are concerned about the UCA, I would just call on them to that, that true love casts out fear and that we should have the courage to to evangelize on this topic, the same way you would evangelize on the gospel. And, um, and the UCA is one way that we can muster our resources to do that much more effectively. We've just been scattered and isolated. And, and we, we it wasn't a fair fight, we get in the ring. And, and we're this, you know, little untrained guy like me, overweight untrained out of shape guy going against muhammad ali would just get pummeled and if if there are if the trinity um if the trinity is truly false like we believe we owe it to the christian world to be out there and advocating against it the same way we do against atheism or anything else that that we that we see as harming people and keeping them from from coming to god so i uh I guess my, my argument is take heart and let's have courage and, and engage. And mm-hmm. 
we'll see. Well, you know, the, the Unitarian movement faltered and basically, basically failed in the, in the late 18th and early, or early 1900s. Um, because they, they allowed themselves to be persuaded by the transcendentalists and others. Um, and so we've got examples of where that, that failing can happen. Um, but as an open theist, I'm saying, yep, that's exactly how God works. And he allows people to make decisions. And, and so we just have a responsibility for, for our own, for our own responsibilities, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and world affairs, they'll have to, they'll have to work out on their own. Sure. This is a question that I asked um, Sean Finnegan. Um, what do you think are sort of the benefits, personal, spiritual, for the church, uh, what have you, of, of Unitarianism? Mm. Um, uh, other yeah. than sort of the being right in the abstract, uh, <laughs> right. what, what, what good do you think it does? For me, it's, um, it's fundamental because we, all of a sudden we have a better definition of who Jesus was. And we also have, then it allows us to have a better definition of who we are and what our role is. When you have a, a human, a purely human Jesus, um, now all of a sudden his example and, and our, our command to follow in his footsteps, man, it takes on a whole new meaning. And, um, you know, when he's sweating blood in the garden of Gethsemane, this isn't God faking it or half of his, you know, one of his natures that's uncomfortable with what's about to happen. Uh, this is a real human, just like you and I, that's having to decide to submit himself in faith that that God's going to fulfill his promises to him, even though what he's looking at is a terrible death and the end of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, all of a sudden, our Christian walk becomes not one of fideism or uh, sort of Gnostic um, enlightenment or something. All of a sudden, it's there's these really practical everyday life matters um that become our responsibility just fundamentally and um and i think it saves us from some of the pitfalls that that some that uh, i would argue the reformed wing of the protestant reformation fell into um when you have a when you when you have a jesus that's sort of a socinian jesus or or a fully human jesus you, you can't have some of these other doctrines total. And this is probably what scares some people about Unitarianism is it isn't just the Trinity that falls. It's a whole package, in my view, a whole package of doctrines that get challenged. And so for me, it's atonement. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, told it's basically every point in Tulip, I think gets challenged by it. Um, your doctrine of, of foreknowledge, gets challenged i think because all of a sudden you have a human that could have said to god nope i think i'm gonna run i like the apostles did you, you, jesus could have run um and it, it gives a whole nother like d dimension to i think what we're doing here and i i think it redefines what god's end game is for each of us you know this theosis idea is is interesting it's it's i, I think there's an element of truth where we're supposed to be conformed to to both christ's image and he's the the express image of god right and we're returning to what we were supposed to be with Adam. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that happen? Um, I mean, now I'm just, I'm just sharing my, my personal theological cards, but I think this idea of a metaphysical regeneration that all of a sudden resolves our, our situation. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that matches the story at all. I think there has to be a much more earthy physical um, change over time through willful obedience that has to happen in us. And for me, I focus on the, the, the definition of faith that, that's, that's regarding trust. And we're supposed to be both trusted by God and, and proven trustworthy. So we have to trust God, but also we have to prove that we're trustworthy. I mean, if, if we're folks that believe in a, in a coming kingdom, um, I've said this before, I heard William Lane Craig ask, why will there be no sin in, in, in heaven, you know, in the, in, in the, the eschaton? And he said, God will remove our ability to sin. <laughs> and I said, then what was the point of any of this? <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if that's ultimately the, the solution, right? So there has to be some other way that, that, we, that God can bring people into a kingdom and, and be willing to trust them. So for me, uh, Unitarianism and a, a human Jesus, it changes the level of expectation for me in my life. It's a long way to say sure. I have much higher expectations for myself than I would if I were a, a, a Trinitarian uh, covered by grace alone and never able to, to emulate Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that there, that when there is this lack of ontological separation or distinction between a Christian and Jesus, and, and it's not like we're saying there wasn't something special about Jesus, right? Sure. There, there were sure uniquenesses to Jesus, but Absolutely. not uh, the hypostatic union being the, the specific <laughs> right. way to describe right. that uniqueness. But, right. But or an immaculate his, conception of or his an mother or, conception right. or I don't know, however yeah. else you want to put it, but yeah. that he really was like us, that, yeah. that he, he was a human being, that he had the challenges that we face that, and he had the opportunities that we also have opportunities for. I think that that makes, I, I don't know. I just, it makes the gospel so much more exciting to read for me. I, I feel like, trinitarians feel like i think the basic thing is this that that the trinity often makes jesus an object of reverence rather than an exemplar a thing to have faith in rather than an example of what faith looks like i love that yeah it's a great mm -hmm. point yep so, Not so, that we don't have faith in Jesus in a certain way, right? That he's, you know, <laughs> loyal to us. Like in the same way, I have faith in my parents and, you know, right. faith in my wife and stuff like that. There's even a special faith in Jesus, but it's not like he is the thing that I'm, I don't know, that is somehow other than from me. He's right. a brother like me who shows me what it's like to relate to God. Absolutely. We want to have faith in Jesus as our mediator and a high priest, but we want the faith of Jesus in the God, the father. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I, and I, I, I know Trinitarians will, will claim the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just not the same drama when the divine nature is offered the thing Satan offers him, right? Yeah. When, when you have the human Jesus who just has had the bomb, he's been confirmed as the Messiah, right? In his own mind. And he's driven into the wilderness. These are real tangible things that he's being offered right? Mm -hmm. All the kingdoms of the world, that is exactly what the Messiah is supposed to receive, right? Mm -hmm. So what he's being offered is a shortcut. You don't have to follow God all the way down this path that, that, that leads to the Garden of Gethsemane and it leads to the cross. Nope. I can just give you what you're being promised right now. Mm -hmm. And how many of us, if we're offered the $50 billion check, are like, no, thanks. Don't want the $50 billion check. I'm good with what I've, what I've been, been given here. I want to be obedient to God. That mm -hmm. becomes real, his yeah. real life. He, he forsook everything, wife, family, uh, respect of his own family. <laughs> um, you know, all of the promises that were to the Messiah, he forsook them for a time in, ho in, in faith that God was going to eventually fulfill those promises. And that takes an enormous amount of, it's enormously, um, uh, admirable and, and worth emulating. And so, yeah, our atonement theories all start changing, I think, and, and our doctrine of man and just all these things start, start being, I think, uh, matured and become clearer from it. And um, I'm still in that process. I still find it exciting. I still go back to, yeah. to, to ideas that, that I'm, you know, caring from my, from my youth and, and challenging them and using this frame and saying, do they make more sense now? And I just keep finding that the answer is yes. And so even if, you know, there are lots of reasons not to be a Trinitarian. Uh, we've got a video where I, I listed 10 of mine on the UCA website uh, or U YouTube channel, and there's lots more. Um, but one good one is it makes more sense of your systematic theology, I think. And uh, there have been a few Unitarian systematic theologies out there but I, I'm basically working on my own in my own head for myself mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in cooperation with people that I respect, because I, I think ultimately we're all doing that, right? We're all kind of building our own systematic theology in our head piece by piece. And, um, and I just think this is a really important piece of that to set, to set the stage. Yeah. I think, I think another exciting thing, there's something it's when you have less of an emphasis on mystery, Right. Mm. And it's not like Unitarians are claiming, oh, we understand every last detail about God. Like, no, right. we've never said that. And no right. one ever says that. Right. But but it it seems to open up this horizon of learning 
instead of setting a wall about how far you can go yeah. and that it seems to kind of just invite you into this continued path of growing to learn more and more about god Absolutely. instead of being like well you can get this far and now you're done right yeah it, it, it values seeking, right? Because we're constantly told to seek, ask, and knock. And there's like, if, if you look at, do a word study on seek, it's just everywhere <laughs> um, that we're supposed to seek God. And that's what's valuable is when you rise up and when you lie down, you're teaching your kids and, and you're constantly in prayer and you're constantly in, in reflection and you're constantly obeying his commands in seeking him and in, in trying to understand him compared to the mystery card, which leads, in my opinion, to fideism. It just forces you into valuing ignorance and valuing the, the trust, you, the ignorant, the blind faith that you have. And maybe that's unfair. I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, cast, um, cast people in, in an unfair light. But for me, that's what it would have led to. It would have led me to saying, it, God is intentionally keeping me in the dark to see if I will keep walking in the dark. And I just don't think that's the God of Christianity. It's not the God of, of the Old Testament. It's not the God of the New Testament that's constantly revealing himself through, through his Messiah and to his apostles. I just, I just don't think that works. And I think the kind of, um, that kind of fideism that I think exists within the, the, the church tradition I think it goes directly back to the to the Trinity and to the the hypostatic union where people are just discouraged from from thinking about it. And maybe that makes us sound like rationalists, but like that's a term I'll take. If somebody wants to insult me by calling me a rationalist, I'll take that <laughs> as opposed to the alternative. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so are you so are you self-identifying as an irrationalist? That's or? right. <laughs> what's, what's my alternative to being a rationalist? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So <laughs> that's a good point. Um, yeah. So what what do you think? It, what do you see happening? What are your predictions for like the next couple years of the Unitarian movement? What do you think you can see happening? What do you think is sort of stirring? And what do you kind of hope will happen? So my <laughs> we're, we had an, uh, there's a there's been a long uh, discussion here recently on the uh, U UCA Facebook group about the gifts of the spirit. So I'm about to expose myself as not a prophet. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to, to know. I, I see there's an enormous amount of interest in the public. You know, we, we, some of our videos, we'll, we'll sponsor them and we'll have 20,000 Trinitarians see the ad and watch the video. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there'll be a couple hundred that are in, <laughs> enraged. And so they, they come voice their, <laughs> their frustration. And then there will be a, a few people that are like, oh, this is really helpful. Thank you. Uh, what next steps would you recommend? And I'm watching the, the, the proliferation of Unitarian materials online. Um, more and more people adding their voices. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Some of these, I, I've been trying to, I've been trying to answer the question that, that, that you're asking for myself for a little while to try to help bring about the, the version of that future that I want yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> and studying how religious movements succeed and fail and, and what they do right and what they do wrong. And as long as it stays decentralized um, as far as control, but very focused on message, they tend to, they tend to succeed. And so the pitfalls that I see are sectarianism within us Mm -hmm. um, in an effort to stay pure, in a misguided effort to stay pure, I would say, um, people choose not to work together on this issue. Yeah. They decide. But this yeah. is a weird trait of Unitarianism that it often attracts people with a slightly disagreeable personality because, <laughs> you know, it yes. takes some guts to disagree with the vast majority yeah. opinion. And it yep. often takes people who are very comfortable coming to their own conclusions, right? Um, yep. So, yep. you know, like all of those things we sort of self-select for those kind of traits in people. It's a little <laughs> bit hard to get a whole bunch, a, a large group of such people to, yep. to agree about very much and to work together. Um, very true. 
But and I yet, think that those people are sort of like the bleeding edge too, mm -hmm. that, that there yeah. are the more agreeable cooperative unity focused people out there and, <laughs> and, and, and we'll get them in eventually too. And we need right. a little bit more of that sometimes. Yep. And we need, I think we need the, the leadership. Um, we need people with a voice to remind us all, I need this reminder sometimes too, that within this inner circle of our fellowships, absolutely we want purity right but within these larger circles of association we want effectiveness mm -hmm. we want to mass our resources so we can have an impact and even the most ornery independent-minded unitarian <laughs> loves that yeah. they want that impact on the world that's why they're ornery is, and we is, we, we could good. list a couple names of such people between <laughs> us i'm sure but yes, yes yes i think and if if any of you are listening feel free to message me and say was it me and i can say <laughs> yep i was thinking about you uh, <laughs> look i'm that guy sometimes i get i get fired up when i when i hear some you know some trinitarian apologist make a really bad argument and and people and people eat it up because you know there's a there's a quote from a uh, an old Aaron Sorkin movie that, you know, people uh, people are just they're they're eating the sand because there's no water to drink, and the the other character says no people eat the sand because they don't know the difference. Really cynical. I just don't agree with that. I don't think people eat the sand because they don't know the difference. They haven't been offered the water, and so if Unitarians can just if we can keep offering the water, um, I don't care how many different buckets it takes bring your own water carriers on your own um but let's all dump the water on the trinitarian fire um i mean i, I think about if if you want a, a non-religious and uh, example i mean if we look at the american revolution i'm something of a history buff military history nerd um look it was the ornery people that got that started <laughs> It was the it was the Sam Adams and the you know yeah I'll take um, personal credit for uh, <laughs> for the Sam Adams yeah yes <laughs> um, but then it it took it took steady leadership and it took eventually ultimately it was the moral it's just like the civil rights movement too it was the moral authority that the group had that mm -hmm. ultimately won over enough people to have the movement succeed um, you know. Luther King, it was his appeal to moral authority that Americans heard and said, yep, that's right. And I have to, I have to do something about it. And, um, and it was the same thing, you know, is uh, common sense and, you know, other things in the American revolution that we probably idealize a little bit or guys like me do, but, uh, but that, that brings the public around to saying, no, this is, this is more than just an intellectual exercise this is a moral cause and that's what i think the unitarian movement is i think it's a within christianity it's a moral cause to bring truth as into a, a realm that's as important as more important than any other realm that we engage in in life and so i have no idea where this is going to go <laughs> it's my answer um but i'm it, it depends entirely on on how we how we all interact and how, what we all do and uh so mm -hmm. so we'll see and that makes it exciting it's the movement's still small enough that it could it could disappear could be wiped out um mm -hmm. you know there a lot of these denominations are aging um a lot of them are pretty small um and you know there's only so many you know uh lost sheep out in the woods like yours truly <laughs> they can you know stumble on a podcast and say oh yeah this is the thing and, and want to devote themselves to it um you know before the thing can bleed out so look i think it's a snowball and it little things 200 people in tennessee mm -hmm. it's not world changing in and of itself but you know you look at the protestant reformation it started small too mm -hmm. and then with the right headwinds and the right uh the right circumstances the world can be changed. So mm -hmm. I, I genuinely want to see that. I, I, uh, I came from a church group that believed that the end was imminent and that there was no hope uh, for reaching the world. <laughs> and that's why they built their fences and mm -hmm. waited for Jesus. Um, I don't believe that anymore. I believe we have personal responsibility. We have 2000 years of history of people that could have done that. Um, and that people that stood up and courage for the truth. And we also have 
the villains, and I mean this in all due respect, people that were sincere Christians, but they were arrogant and they were innovators or they were cowardly and they were traditionalists when they should have known better. And so that's my, I don't want to be an, an arrogant innovator on top of what the, the Jesus and the apostles gave us. And I don't want to be a cowardly traditionalist that, that just knows it's easier to stick with, with what he's been given if it's not true. So, um, so for me, it's a moral cause. And, um, and I, I hope that by the time I'm dead, there are millions and millions of people that have been seriously influenced by Unitarian theology. And like I said, I want to see big groups struggling with this um, because it means the truth is being spread. Mm -hmm. Struggling in the good sense. In the yeah. best sense. <laughs> yeah. In the way that, in the <laughs> grappling with. Grappling this with. question. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. we don't want to burn down the sbc but no we wouldn't mind no if they i want it to become to take, unitarian <laughs> yeah and to succeed yeah. even more than it's succeeding now absolutely. absolutely which honestly doesn't seem that hard but uh <laughs> not to pick on the sbc but uh <laughs> no, there, there, is, there is no reason there is no reason that, that um that protestants look i get for catholics this is off the table right they, their their commitment to um, the way God is working in the world and his revelation, it excludes Unitarianism as an option. I get it. Mm -hmm. But for Protestants, it seems like the exact opposite. Yeah. Why, oh, why do Protestants suddenly claim, turn into Catholics on this one subject? All of a sudden, I, yeah. why is William Lane Craig offering the buoys in the channel offered by a conciliar conclusion? Why? In 451 AD. In 451 AD. <laughs> right. Um, when he's supposed to be sola scriptura or prima <laughs> scriptura. I don't, I don't know what Bill yeah. is, but why? It, it To me, it, it boggles the mind. It's the Protestant world. I just think is, it is just right for an, uh, um, for this to become obvious to people and for it to stop being, a, being dangerous and to be c considered. And the day, look, there's... Um, there are my favorite way of measuring this on on theological topics is if I search for a three, four or five views book on whatever the topic is sanctification or divine foreknowledge, can I find it? And is one of the views presented uh, the view that I'm looking at, right? That's how it gets justified as, as legitimate. It means it's in the discussion. So um, the more times that in the discussion people are saying okay here's social trinitarianism here's latin trinitarianism here's monarchical trinitarianism and oh by the way here's a couple of different flavors of unitarianism look at all these and see which fit with your bible and with history when that's happening that's we're winning mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's Here, that's what we're... here's a question are monarchical trinitarians unitarian <laughs> i think it depends on the it depends on the mt <laughs> yeah um as I understand it, the key claim there is the father alone has aseity. Mm -hmm. So I would argue they're, uh, Dr. Tuggy would say they're Unitarian <laughs> because they have one ultimate, one ultimate mm -hmm. God, and then all these subordinate gods, <laughs> there are at least two subordinate gods. I think it's just polytheism. That sounds a lot like <laughs> the Greek pantheon to me. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have, if you have Zeus who has aseity and you got these others that, that well, it gets strangely close thought. to Armstrongism, right? It, oh, it yeah. Is, I came yeah. out of that, man. Like, I did that. <laughs> I, I did MT. I did monarchical Trinitarianism, binitarianism. <laughs> um, no, and it and it totally um, still runs into all the same problems that the incarnate, the two natures incarnation stuff has. It does, yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think it really solves it. It allows them to say that they have one God, the Father alone, mm -hmm. which because of their New Testament, they want to say, and I appreciate that, and I applaud them for it. That's exactly right. We have one God, the Father alone, and so did many, many, many of the church fathers, right? right. They said the same thing. Um, and then they turned around and said, and oh, we have another God, <laughs> like lower G God or whatever. Um, thank you, Origen, and I guess thank you, Justin Martyr, for that. Um, so yeah, I think it's just sort of originist or, or, or something. Um, and And I think it's helpful as a wedge. Like I, I wish Bo Branson and the people that think that way, all the luck in the world, um, because at some point they're going to, that's, that's going to stir the pot. And, um, and if they're right, that's great. 
and and the truth will be, will be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're wrong, it's it's going to make obvious. Why would they do this? Why would they reject all these other models? Um, and and I think people need to need to ask that question. Why would someone like Bill Branton say, no, nope, all the other Trinity models on offer are wrong um, because they don't square with the New Testament. They don't identify the one God as the Father alone. Why would he, you know, if a Unitarian says that, it's like, ah, oh, you cultists. But Bo Branson can say, no, I'm a Trinitarian and I'm saying this. And all of a sudden, at least for some people, that's okay. Yeah. So it just shows how, how much this is cultural. And I, not- I feel, I feel, yeah, I have interesting thoughts on monarchical Trinitarianism, right? Mm-hmm. Like Bo Branson is sort of leading the wing from the Orthodox and Joshua Sujuade is sort of leading it from the Catholic wing. Um, and I feel like once people hear what they're saying, then all of a sudden they can much more easily understand what Unitarians are saying, yeah. right? Yeah. It kind of, it gets the conversation going. And yeah. I, I mean, like I will say monarchical Trinitarianism is the only form of Trinitarianism to me that comes close to making sense at all. Yeah. And, and that I can totally see why Bo Branson and, and uh, people like him are persuaded by that. Sure. Um, but it, it, it's building this weird bridge, right? It's getting the Trinity, Trinitarianism circles and the Unitarianism circles strangely close together. Yep. And, you know, to be honest, I've seen some people go from Unitarian over to yep. Trinitarian via the yep. monarchical Trinitarian bridge, but there's yep. no, re- bridges have a weird thing of facilitating traffic <laughs> in both directions. And it'll, right. it'll be hard to see which uh, direction is more popular in the long run. So totally agree. I, it, I kind again, of, it gives people sorry, I apologize, but no, I'm, no, I'm just no, thinking no. it gives people this, this menu of options and they realize it's a spectrum. When you start mm-hmm. realizing there's a spectrum of options, now it's not so obvious that we're all Trinitarians. Right. Are we? Mm-hmm. If there's this wide spectrum, uh, how, how, where do you make, where are you going to draw the line from this end of, I don't know, what is uh, three self, I don't know where you want to put the ends. Yeah. <laughs> Unitarianism yeah. and three self Trinitarianism, right? Uh, uh-huh call this the most polytheistic version i don't know um because you could argue M- i could argue mt is the most polytheistic but anyway right. <laughs> um where are you going to draw the line and say okay here's orthodoxy stops here and here's why um okay but that why is likely to start slicing in here too mm-hmm. and so yeah i it's why dr tuggy's work is so valuable i know sometimes people beat him up about in debates like that his exegesis isn't as good as they would like or whatever, but it's because he's playing out of position a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not to rip on his, his, his biblical work is good too. Um, Really good. Um, Mm -hmm. But he's, but he's just killer on working out the logical implications of these different theories. What are people actually saying, holding their feet to the, to the fire and explicating their Trinity view. And he's the one that's saying there isn't one Trinity view. There are Trinities. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that becomes really understood in the mainstream and it stops being seen as an abundance, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the expression? Uh, uh, it's an embarrassment a, of uh, riches. Yeah, embarrassment of riches. <laughs> right. Yeah. And just mm-hmm. an embarrassment, uh, <laughs> the, the better. And the more, the more Christians are going to have a chance to, to tackle it themselves. Because, look, there's an element of this that it's a useful, um, it's a useful mystery, Right. There's something fundamentally useful to a, a clergy system yes. with having a, with having a mystery or a uh, a highly complex theological view that they can explain to the laity. Mm-hmm. And there, I don't want to. I mean, I think a sociologist would say, "Oh, yeah, that's totally why the Christian. This is why this happened, right? They they yeah. have a sociological that, that, explanation. That's, uh, that's generally my explanation. So why did the Trinity win back in the day?" And I think that, like you could say, as the Roman Empire was descending into the Dark Ages, you could even complement it a little bit and say, look, the literacy rates were falling, the economic situation was falling. Um, For Christianity to survive, it had to be very hierarchical with a small elite because the the masses were not going to be able to be literate and to think very much for themselves. And it had to turn back into like a, a religion for peasants before it could, you know, before Europe climbed back out into the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and stuff sure. like that. 
and that the trinity kind of matched that structure in that there's the the elite who knows and understands and the uh the follower the laity who has to trust and, and be told that they can't understand right yep. i think that that kind of that, that those two things paired together very well which was part of the reason why the trinity won absolutely and, and historians like uh well, I'd like to reference Keegan Chandler's book on Constantine, which I found really helpful. A lot of Unitarians are like, I don't know that I care about Constantine. Mm -hmm. But what's really helpful about it, I think, is it shows how the way uh, the ruling structure um, needed to parallel, the religious structure needed to parallel the ruling structure yeah. for there to be stability in a, in a society. And so Roman emperors would often favor a theological view that mirrored the current governmental structure. If there were four tetriarchs or whatever, <laughs> then man, all of a sudden there's four gods that we're worshiping and look at that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and if Constantine wants to unify the the his people, he needs a one sun god or one god of Christianity um, with an envoy between God and men. Mm -hmm. Boy, that if if I have a people that believe in that, and I can position myself to look like that guy. That works really well for me sociologically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's lots of different ways to look at this from 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 history, where we can totally understand why the doctrine developed the way it did, um, both from like a like a theological development sta sta stage, you know, from from what I think was the original view to this kind of logos view with an origins innovation of eternal generation. And then you step into the Nicene argument and all of a sudden you have this uh, equality of natures. And then, you know, it takes another 60 years and like, well, it sounds like we've got to unify these two. So we don't have two gods and right. We got to worship one God somehow. So we need to, to take this multiplicity and back engineer a unity from it. So now you got the, the being person distinction introduced and, um, and you can just see how it happens. And now that we've got that, how are we to explain one of these three uh, hypostases is is visible on Earth when he's supposed to be a part of the of of the one being that's you know? And under classical theism, is boy, it becomes so hard. You know, it's yeah. immutable and and <laughs> eternal and and unchanging and timeless and, all and without stuff. parts, without you, parts, you divine think... simplicity. Yeah, Jesus had some parts, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and and the and the, the human uh, the human nature sure seems like a part of the hypostatic <laughs> union to me. And like I anyway, we can track that I think, and mm -hmm. when we can do that for people, um, I I found that some of the most stark evidence. And then you could go back to your New Testament and say, all right, is this a plausible reading of John? Is this a plausible reading of I don't know Paul's view of Jesus? Is, is he the original creator or is he the creator of a new creation? Is you can start I think it becomes a live option. And so you can compare your readings all of a sudden. You're not yeah. trapped within one, uh, with one, one, within one perspective and everybody else obviously just can't read. All of a sudden you can start seeing it through different perspectives and you can weigh them and evaluate them against each other. And look, I, that's the danger of fundamentalism, right? It's, it's, that was the problem with my group is you lack the ability, you lack the training, you lack even like the moral um, compulsion to really see it through other perspectives. And that's part of why I really value all of the Unitarian work that's going on out there is usually it does that well. It just, mm -hmm. and your channel is a perfect example of that. We have to really understand our Trinitarian friends if we're going to engage with it. We get, we got to make sure that we've tested it and that we're, um, that we're not building straw men. Yeah. It's so easy. Like one thing that I, I really admired about Jake, Brancatella when he was debating with James White is it was clear James Brancatella or Jake sorry Jake Brancatella mm -hmm. knew the church fathers better than James White like yeah. and, and James yeah. White gets put in this really weird position when the Muslim apologist knows the church fathers better <laughs> than the Calvinist you know yeah. you're gonna you're gonna start to look silly um yeah 
I think I think an interesting question, like we sort of talked about how there might be some kind of social socio historical reasons for why the Trinity won. And then it's interesting thinking about, well, what's the sociological situation of religion now? And mm-hmm. what does that favor? Mm-hmm. And, you know, with literacy rates way above 90 percent and the Internet and stuff like that, a more egalitarian form of doctrine that uh, is open to everybody and yeah. that's open to expect inspection and transparency and those sorts of things as opposed to being the reserve of a clerical class makes yep. a lot of sense although so, sometimes i feel like we might be living in the age of a dying empire ourselves but <laughs> hopefully not <laughs> yeah Some parallels, i feel that but, but i feel hopefully that not too many parallels look this this is going to sound like it's pretty far afield but I was watching a documentary about the development of the alphabet and the development of writing. And it described the incredibly high literacy rates within the Roman empire that were directly correlated to the availability of Egyptian papyrus. Yeah, Papyrus yeah. was, it was, it was Cheap easily paper. accessible. Yeah. yeah. Right. And even a, a day laborer in the Roman empire in Rome could have a paperback right yeah. and 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 he could he could read and um and and, that and paul is, who clearly didn't have very much money could purchase some paper and write a multi-page write letter to a church and send it off absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. and that ends with the roman empire and the development of vellum yeah. where now you got to cut an animal in half yeah. <laughs> and tan mm-hmm. it and do all this work to create the writing surface yeah. And the, the, they were even talking the difference in the writing service. Papyrus is easy; you can just scribble something out quick. Well, yeah. vellum, you got to scrape it out kind of on it, and it's this really valuable thing. And all of a sudden, books become these rare commodities for the the, the rich and the elite, um, of course. And then Gutenberg's press hits, and all of a and, sudden, well, we and see, paper paper making technology from China. And the yes. printing press at the same time. So you got yep. the synergy at the synergy of those two things, cheap paper and cheap production. Yeah. Absolutely. And out of that comes a reformation. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, I think there's a correlation between what happened with with that of uh, that explosion of information and what's happening now. With and if I were a Trinitarian, yeah. I'd be very worried about that, that, that you and I can go to Wikipedia mm-hmm. and immediately have access to the church fathers. Uh, translate out of the Greek into the English, and we can mm-hmm. evaluate it for ourselves, right? right? I don't have to be in seminary. We can read. We can read every church follow that's been translated into English for free right now. Yep. Right. Yep. A- and how many can. people in history had that access? To almost say, no. The tri- yeah. <laughs> almost nobody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're talking people f- fifty years ago, mm-hmm. not not five hundred years ago, not even three hundred years ago. 50 years ago, it wasn't like this. Yeah, 10 years ago, it wasn't like this. Yeah. Right? And now it's like, oh, you want the Dead Sea Scrolls? Those are over here, here right? You, you know, <laughs> it's exactly. And so, so I feel like these sorts of things, you can see kind of the podcast YouTube media scape changing politics, changing mm-hmm. all sorts of other, you know, science and all these other sorts of things are grappling with the same transformation of in, uh, information accessibility. And I think that it's perfectly reasonable to expect there to be theological and ecclesiological transformations too. And us yeah. Unitarians are like, bring it on, you yeah. know, <laughs> thank heavens. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, right. And, and I think that not every church is feeling like that right now. I think that there are a strange yeah. number of Protestant churches who feel more like the Catholic church when the Gutenberg press came out than like Martin Luther did when the, uh, the print, printing press was made available yeah. than vice versa. So it's time to be on the right side of history. We don't want to be the people that bound up the Anabaptists and threw them in the in the river in a bag and let them drown. You want to be mm-hmm. baptized? We'll baptize you. Don't be on the wrong side of history on this thing. Uh, you know, don't be the people burning the folks at the stake. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to, we want to be on the right side of this. If if history continues for another five hundred years, don't be with the people that squandered all the information that spent their time watching you know people dancing on TikTok or you know, watching, you know, reality TV, you you had access to the entire library of the church fathers, and you don't know who they are. You have access to 50 translations of the New Testament, and you're reading the message. 
you've got forget I'll, or I'll, exclusively the message maybe i have a copy of the message, message so <laughs> you can check the message sometimes it's yeah. fine just <laughs> not, not to just not don't to rely on, on the message not to pick on all amplified bibles but yeah. um but you know the, 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 i think we have this accountability because of our time you know we, we have more free time than ever before we have more resources more information and yeah i personally feel just accountable in a way that you know, if, if I was a peasant in a French field before the Reformation, I that guy that guy who was leading his family and going to the, the mass, he was doing with what he had, um, mm -hmm. and I got to count on on God showing that 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 understanding of that circumstance. But I have been given all of this, and to whom much is given, much is required. So I I think um, I think that drives Unitarians. We we. We feel this really fundamental responsibility about this. And uh, and look, even if we were wrong, we would have this fundamental responsibility, right? Because mm -hmm. we got to run it all the way down. We should challenge it all the way until somebody persuades us or until we persuade them. Because um, it's just not okay to, to, sit, uh, to sit on the sidelines of something so important. So um, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm exercised about this thing. Yeah. Well, that might be a, a good closing remark. I think <laughs> I think that was that was really well said, uh, Brandon. I, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, I'm excited about what the UCA, UCA is doing, and I'm excited for the conference uh, this October. Me too. I can't wait to see you there and and to see anybody else that's uh, that's listening. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. All right. Thanks, Brandon.